This week on The Grind, Bill and Tim head to North Dakota for The Grind's first hunt in the States with great friend Rick Darling of North Country Guide Service. After a wet spring and a great hatch, everyone is excited to revisit a familiar spot and to make some great memories in the blind. Bill also takes advantage of being in close proximity of Delta Waterfowl's headquarters and sits down with a few experts to hear about Delta's efforts in the Prairie Pothole region. Waterfowl TV is brought to you by Dakota Decoy, premium gunning decoys for demanding hunters. Lucky Duck, masters of deception. Kent Cartridge, quality matters and performance counts. Mud Buddy, the king of mud motors. Excel, the boat to own. Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the most accessible online retriever training program. Yoder Smokers, handcrafted in the heartland. Rig'em Right Waterfowl, the industry leader in specialty waterfowl products. On X Hunt, know where you stand. Benelli, simply perfect. Cowboys Wild Game Washer, as clean as you can get them. And these fine sponsors. Well, we are on our way to Leeds, North Dakota. Uh, we're gonna hook up with Tim No from Lucky Duck uh, with our good friend Rick Darling uh, at North Country Guide Service. And we're back in the States. Uh, some many years, this is our first hunt of the year, but this year we were fortunate enough we went up into Canada for a few days. But this is our first stateside hunt. It's early October. Uh, we're driving through North Dakota right now and it is dry. Uh, you can see where a lot of the little water holes that were water are dried up, uh, dust in the air. I was telling Cody when we drove up this spring headed north to go snow goose hunting, this whole area was underwater, flooded, but it is dry now. But I think, according to Rick, they had water when they needed it for the duck, duck hatch, and it sounds like some of the puddle ducks are up in numbers, so I'm hoping for a good year. Last year we came up here and, and it was the, the drought year, and the drought was at the wrong time when the ducks needed the water to, to breed. and. Uh, there were no ducks, a lot of old ducks. So we're hopeful. I'm pretty excited for this hunt too. I've got Hank back with me. Um, Hank turned seven, I believe, either the end of August or the first of September. And SOK uh, decided to basically retire him from his breeding duties. And pretty sure old Hank's here with me to stay. So I shouldn't have any of those sad Januaries when he goes back to Wally. But uh, it's my first hunt back with Hank. And uh, I was telling Cody, he, he knows we're going hunting. His ears were perked up last night when I was, I was packing the truck up. So it'll be the first hunt of the year for Hank. And it looks like Hank will be staying with me. Good to see you. Did you have a good drive? Yeah, long. Yeah, Chris, yeah. good to see you again. Good to see you. Yeah. Look at this guy. How you doing? Good, how you doing?
The only other thing we've seen sometimes though is they get on that hill and they're following it and then they get a little tall coming up, getting up to their rise and coming up. The most important part of the hunt and the part I hate the worst, <laughs> covering blinds. Good, stay down. Sounds like ducks. First run with the new XHDI spinner. See if we can kill a bunch of ducks over them today. It's the first week, week of October here. Um, hasn't been a whole lot of migration yet, but Rick did say that they're picking some snows up. So the migration started this warm spell we got going on is going all the way up, geez, all the way up to the Northwest Territories. So talked to Ben Webster up in uh, Saskatchewan and he said they hunted the first day below freezing. So, uh, but we saw a lot of ducks coming in last night. Uh, Rick's found this, it's a oat field and it was full last night of mallards. So we're hopeful here. This is our, our U.S. opener. Uh, get rolling here. Rick, as you'll see when the light comes up, decoy salesman's dream. We have more decoys out than I think I put out combined all year, but uh, it's the way Rick does it. I think we've got like maybe 15 or 20 luckies running. Um, we got Tim's new flocker. We're gonna run a couple of the luckies on the flocker. I'm anxious to see how that works. I'm gonna try that in the marsh this year and see how it works, but uh, get finished set up here and our first morning in North Dakota. One pintail. You can put that right in the, yep, it's gonna be the I'm gonna have to eat eat a hole into my shooting, eat a chew a hole <laughs> shooting lane. It's pretty thick, isn't it? Oh. Well, Bill, it's good to be back in North Dakota. Yeah, I love this trip every year. Yeah, it's a fun one. So this first morning hunt, we're sitting out there, everyone's Rib and Rick, of course, you know, bringing us to this hot field he had. And we had one Drake Mallard come, started the whole morning off, and he centered up perfectly for us. We thought to ourselves, you know, man, if they all do it like this, we'll be in and out of here pretty quick. had our second little bunch of ducks come in. Uh, a lot of pintails. Uh, starting to get some color too. When we were up in Canada three weeks ago, they nothing had any color, so it's good to see them coloring up a little bit. Pretty slow so far, but we've only seen two little bunches of ducks. Got enough for duck poppers tonight so far. Flock about a hundred that they're working us for a few minutes. They just did not want to. They wanted to get behind us a little more than we wanted them to, but we took a few out of the kind of that last pass. Shot three or four out of there, so got a few, but it was could have been better.
Every waterfowl hunter knows the importance of conservation practices, and Delta Waterfowl is a leader in doing all they can for successful reproduction year after year. Bill takes some time to sit down with some of the leaders in these efforts to learn more and how all hunters can help provide safe habitats for nesting hens. So Mike, when I think of Delta, the first thing I think of is predator management. You know, that's been on the top of my mind forever. So sure. what is predator management and how does it help the duck population? Sure. Um, so what predator management is, is what we call it the, the seasonal management of local predator populations. And so um, we focus on looking at nest predators, um, trapping them from March 15th to July 15th, because that's the breeding time frame for ducks. And our goal is to increase nest success. So make more nests hatch so more ducks are flying south in the winter. And how we do that, or how that helps, is that there are many areas of the prairies where duck populations or, or nest success um, is below the population maintenance threshold. So ducks need 15 to 20% nest success just to maintain their populations where they are. In a lot of places, Bill, that's less than 10%, less than 5% even in some places. And so um, when we look at the reason why, it's because of predators. 90% of nest failure is due to predators. And so um, by going in with professional trappers and reducing those number of predators, we can elevate nest success by two, three, even fourfold uh, to, to make sure that as many ducks are flying south as possible. Okay, obviously one of the biggest things is where do we, where do we do predation control? So how do you guys determine that and what sets the bar there? Sure, um, so how we determine where we implement this is we have a, a kind of a big complex model that we look at and we look at number of pairs, so number of pairs of nesting ducks. We look at the amount of water on the landscape, we look at the amount of cover on the landscape and all of these things that we have in these models, we can kind of understand where ducks need help the most, where the, the um, nest success is likely to be the lowest. And so that's where we target those areas. You know, we're not setting traps from the southeastern part of South Dakota to northern Alberta and every culvert and farmstead and tree row. We're, we're looking at very isolated areas, very targeted areas, because we know that that's what it takes to increase nest success to, at, a, at a meaningful scale. So Mike, I mean, of, of all the predators, I mean, you see them all. I mean, what do you, I mean, what does the basic person need to know about, uh, is it fox, is it skunk, is it squirrel? Is, I mean, all of the above, what, what do you all, see as the main? Kind of all of the above, you know, our, our, I would say the number one predators out there right now are raccoons and skunks. And that's mainly because purely of, of the sheer number of them that are out there. You know, there are other predators that probably on an individual basis can can depredate more nests than a, an individual raccoon or an individual skunk. But 80% of what we're catching out on the landscape is raccoons and skunks and because and that's because the landscape lends itself to them. These are these are animals that thrive in the type of landscape that this that the prairies have become with a lot of edge, very small patches of habitat. And so raccoons and skunks are really our number one one and two uh, sure. predators out there. So when you when you target an area for predator control, you go in, you hire individual trappers, yes, sir. local yep. trappers. Uh, do you continue? Is it an ongoing year to year basis on the same nesting ground, or do you jump around, or how do you do that? Well, it, it really can kind of vary uh, depending on the on the situation. So um, the biggest thing is that. Yes, we do hire professional trappers and they're local people too. We're not bringing in a lot of people from, from outside. They're the local guy that, that traps in the fall for fur anyways. And so we're, we're giving them an opportunity to trap for us in the spring to target those animals that really aren't targeted in the fur harvest. And um, to answer your question as to repeatability, yes, we do go back to the same areas more often than not, time after time, because we've seen that you know, especially these types of predators, they, they can move into an area quite quickly. We can, we can reduce them very effectively during the breeding season, but you know, they also have eight months to kind of filter back in. And so hitting those areas repeatedly out year after year definitely ensures high nest success. Um, as the morning progressed, uh, we were seeing mallards and it, it, it was good to see last year when we were here, uh, the real, when the drought started, uh, and the drought last year was right at a crucial time when the ducks needed water to breed uh, and they didn't have it. 
This year, they had water to breed. It's incredibly dry right now, um, but it looks like seeing the numbers of ducks we saw today. I think, you know, what, what you read, the puddle duck, a lot of the puddle duck population might be up a little bit. We started seeing big bunches of mallards. Uh, we let a few pintail bunches go. Um, we had some pintails and mallards come in mixed, and if we could pick out just a single drake, one guy would shoot the single drake rather than everyone shooting and possibly dropping more pintails. <laughs> So Bill, you guys were up in Canada, what, a couple weeks ago? Three weeks, yeah. Yeah, and color, they're all brown, right? Yeah, even browner than this guy. He's starting to get some. Just starting to change yeah. colors. This is much further along, but yep. still not fully plumed. No. It's amazing though, three weeks. Mm-hmm. I mean, they looked like hens three weeks ago. <laughs> I mean. Let's get in our hole. <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> That's one of the longest, biggest geese I think I've ever seen. Uh, we had big flocks of anywhere from 50 to a couple hundred ducks, um, kind of wave after wave. And not every, not every flock would finish, um, but we were uh, picking away at them, had some really good volleys, um, shot a good number of ducks today. Uh, and it was, a, it was a great hunt. And it was interesting, bright sun this morning, and then all of a sudden the fog rolled in about 9, 9.30. Um, and it was like the fog came out of nowhere and the humidity, you could feel it in the air. Um, it kind of slowed everything down. Uh, we weren't, you couldn't see very far because of the fog. Um, we still shot a few ducks and a couple geese after the fog rolled in, but it was a unique morning from bright sun, all of a sudden to mid morning fog. Um, so great, great hunt, finished uh, the morning out well, um, finished day one well, and we're looking forward to the next couple days. What's up guys, I'm Barton Ramsey from Cornerstone Gundog Academy and today I'm going to talk about how to get a crisp whistle stop with your dog. We've all seen it, dog being sent on a blind retrieve, barreling out to the bird, handler blows the whistle and boom, dog spins around with confidence, sits up high, excited about the next step in the retrieve. That's what we all want from our dogs, but a lot of times we see dogs that stop with a little hesitation. Maybe they take 10 or, 10 or 8 more steps and barely turn around, or maybe they stop and they look nervous because they're unsure of what's going on. In order to have a crisp, clean whistle stop with your dog and a lot of confidence in that stop, you're gonna have to teach your dog that stopping on the whistle is not only a good thing, but it is the path to the reward. 
use the reward-based training. We take puppies at a very young age, we have a whistle, we get them all excited, hit the whistle, hold the, hold the dummy up. As soon as they sit, we throw the dummy and cast the dog. It's an immediate reward for sitting, is getting the retrieve. And then we continue to do this all the way through our tee work, through our pile drills, all of our whistle stop drills. We want our dogs to understand, man, if I sit, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get what I want. That's what teaches dogs, and that's what gets dogs to turn around and sit with a lot of confidence. If you have a dog that's not sitting with confidence, if you have a dog that's, that's maybe late on the whistle sit, or maybe the dog doesn't sit, you know, kind of crouches down, turns around but doesn't really face you, you're gonna wanna back all the way up and go work on some whistle stop drills. Whistle stop on a recall, whistle stop at heel, whistle stop at play. All things that we teach inside Cornerstone to develop that confident sit when the dog is looking at its handler waiting on the next cast. So try that, check out Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy to know where to start, what to do next, and how to solve problems when training your retriever. And now, back to the grind. Next week on The Grind, Bill and Tim continue their trip in North Dakota with two more action-packed days of hunting. While the guys are seeing the impact a wet spring can have for a good hatch, Bill gets another surprise on the last day after Rick loads the trailer a little heavy with some snow goose decoys. You don't want to miss it.